The sights and sounds of South Africa are already spectacular, but in June 2010, they will become even more so. 32 teams will set out in pursuit of a dream to become world champions. This is Destination South Africa. Coming up, Brazil head to South Africa, hoping to lift the World Cup for a sixth time. Pele gives us his thoughts on the class of 2010 as they prepare to face Portugal, Ivory Coast and North Korea in Group G. And Spain stormed to victory at Euro 2008 with some thrilling football. Fernando Torres tells us they're ready for Group H, where they'll take on Switzerland, Chile and Honduras. Brazil have maintained their proud record as the only nation to reach every World Cup. And the five times world champions are in their familiar position, favourites. Brazil will always have this responsibility. I think 2006 was a lesson for us. We were favourites then and ended up going home early. But that's football. Obviously, it's good to be favourites, but on the pitch you have to prove it. Football is very equal these days, and unless you work hard, you won't win on name alone. Brazil's road to the World Cup finals was not always smooth. After failing at the 2006 tournament, there is a new team with a new man at the helm, Dunga. In his first managerial position, the rookie coach felt the pressure right away. Uninspiring draws against Colombia and then Peru reminded Dunga Brazilians expect to win, and win in style. People will say, I don't want to win like that, I want to see real Brazilian football. But then I ask, what is that? Do people want us to play the same way we played in 1970? I don't think that's possible anymore. Brazil have always been renowned for their beautiful game and putting on a show. But there's very little between teams these days. You'll rarely see a team now who can play the artistic way and win. But Brazil's pragmatic style under Dunga wasn't even getting results. A loss to South American minnows Venezuela, albeit in a friendly, was greeted by jeers from the fans. The result drew little sympathy from some former stars. It's difficult to stomach this side. They barely play football. They'll blame the journey or say they're tired. There's an excuse for everything. Things only got worse for the new manager in qualifying. There was a defeat to Paraguay and then a home draw against the old enemy, Argentina. Really, no one is happy with the national team. It's got to the stage where Brazil will play a game and no one's bothered. Something I could never have imagined in my lifetime. Brazil are five times world champions, but constantly in crisis. If we lose one game, then it's a crisis. If it's just a friendly, it's a crisis. I think this word has followed Brazilian football from the beginning. Where the Brazilian national team is concerned, it never rains, it just pours. As a player, Dunga was a combative midfielder, leading his country to the 1994 World Cup. He has a wealth of experience and learnt quickly, never give up. They're a team who have had a difficult ride. They've got a coach in Dunga who has never previously coached before. But he knows the setup at the national team well, and he is a born leader. He showed that as a player, and he was captain of his country. He took up the challenge at a difficult time, but somehow he's made it work. That turn in fortunes came in September 2008, when Brazil travelled to Chile to play Marcelo Bielsa's much fancied young side. It may have been a long way from the beautiful game trademarked by their Brazilian predecessors, but Dunga's side ran out 3-0 winners.
and a new star emerged in the form of Sevilla striker Luis Fabiano. He scored twice here and nine times during Brazil's qualifying campaign. We had a good run at the end of 2008, finishing up with a good win over Uruguay and São Paulo too, which was pretty much Luis Fabiano's debut as a regular starter. And he filled the number nine shirt well, scoring two goals. From that point on, Brazil and Luis Fabiano had a good run. He was top scorer in the qualifiers, and we grew with him in the team. Since his introduction, we haven't lost. Results steadily improved. Brazil took revenge against Venezuela with a 4-0 win, and Dunga was beginning to stamp his mark on the team. This was a side built in his image after all. He removed the egos and instilled a strong team ethic. Yet one player still managed to rise above everyone else. For me, the player who has the most similar style to Pelé is Kaká. He's more complete and more direct. So, of the younger players these days, I think Kaká is the best. I think we've not only got good quality players, we've got the quantity too. I think that's where we're different to other countries. Most other nations don't have great reserves, or they only have one or two players who can offer good backup. The final flourish was still to come. Brazil travelled to Argentina, needing to beat their great rivals to qualify for South Africa. One team has to laugh, the other has to cry. And we'll be the ones with smiles on our faces. We'll be world champions. Few anticipated what followed. Brazil subjected their rivals to a humiliating 3-1 defeat. It was their first ever competitive win in Argentina, and one that left their neighbours in real trouble. Pragmatic they may be, but this Brazil side has few rivals when it comes to technique, physical power and organisation. That win saw Brazil top the South American qualifying group in some comfort with three games to spare. To beat Argentina, in Argentina, by three goals and leave your rivals close to elimination, I think it was very satisfying, especially for Dunga and his players. Up first for Brazil are North Korea at Ellis Park. Dunga's men then face Ivory Coast and Portugal. Dunga has put together a good mix of very experienced players and others who've barely ever played in a World Cup. Unbelievably talented players, but they need to play as a team. Dunga will have a bit of work to do to finish the jigsaw and put players in the right positions. But I think Brazil will give anyone a good game in Africa in 2010. So often the nearly men of world football in recent years, Portugal travel to South Africa as the tournament's dark horses. Last time around, they were beaten by France in the semi-finals. In 2010, this talented side will hope to go one better. Portugal has all the conditions to make Portugal have everything it takes to have a good World Cup. And what makes a good World Cup? I'd say getting beyond the semi-finals and reaching the final. In this case, I'd say at least the semi-finals. It's been all change in the past two years. Manager Luis Felipe Scolari left the post he held for six years to be replaced by former Real Madrid coach Carlos Queiroz. But there are doubts about the current side. This Portuguese side is very good, but I just don't think it's as good as it was four or five years ago. Preparations for the World Cup have been far from perfect, and Portugal's qualification campaign was not a comfortable ride. We had some hurdles to overcome in qualifying. We lost at home to Denmark and we had no luck at all, as it was a game we deserved to win. We ended up losing 3-2 and lost out on three very important points.
que perdemos importantíssimos. The Portuguese were dropping points far too easily. Having lost at home against Denmark, they suffered draws home and away against Sweden. Wasteful finishing and the lack of a top-level striker proved to be their undoing. And their home form was never convincing. We also drew one of our easiest games at home against Albania. So these days, if you lose points at home in qualifying, it makes things difficult, as away games are always so, so hard. Despite their struggles, Portugal have one trump card, Cristiano Ronaldo, Real Madrid's 80 million euro man and 2008's World Player of the Year. He's the best player in the world and someone who deserves to be at a World Cup. If he's in form and can make his mark, then Portugal can go a long way. I hope to see a great Cristiano in 2010 in South Africa as Portugal need him to be great. And I think he can do something incredible in this World Cup. But even Ronaldo can't win games on his own. Once again, Portugal squandered chances against Denmark in September 2009, and they were made to pay. Portugal finished runners-up to Denmark in their qualification group. Only a playoff victory against Bosnia ensured their safe passage to South Africa. The World Cup gives you very different games and very different atmospheres in comparison to the qualifiers. These days, qualifying games are so difficult, with teams who fight so hard to get to a World Cup. Port Elizabeth is the setting for Portugal's opener against Ivory Coast, before they take on North Korea and Brazil. Portugal can Portugal can surprise a few people. Given that they've struggled so much to get to South Africa, I think they could have an excellent World Cup. The World Cup is heading to Port Elizabeth in the Eastern Cape province. The Nelson Mandela Bay Stadium is ready to host five group games, including the showdown between Ivory Coast and Portugal. This is one of the nation's principal ports set on the Algoa Bay and is regarded as the water sports capital of South Africa. With a population of just over a million people, Port Elizabeth is located 770 kilometers along the coastline from Cape Town and was founded in 1820 to house British settlers. The Nelson Mandela Bay Stadium is stunning. Comprising five tiers and capable of holding 48,000 fans, it cost $270 million to build and is located overlooking the North End Lake in the centre of the city. It's another of South Africa's brand new stadia and is the first of its kind to be built in the area. Eight World Cup games in total will be played here. We are eating and we are so excited. We can't wait to welcome the world to Port Elizabeth. Nelson Mandela Bay and South Africa, and especially the East in Cape. We are ready to rumble. We are ready to roll. The World Cup arrives in Africa for the first time ever. So when the tournament gets underway, expect colour and African passion. And expect a World Cup like never before. African football has been steadily improving over the years. And perhaps Africa's best hope of lifting the trophy lies with the team from the Ivory Coast. For quite a few years, we've had a good generation of players. 
We've been a group of friends, and I think when you have that, it helps you grow as a team and helps you on the pitch too. And I think that's probably the key to our strength. Vahid Halihodzic was in charge of a squad that qualified for the World Cup in emphatic style, winning all their home qualifying games by some impressive margins. We played really, really well at home. We were effective and sometimes quite spectacular. We won 5 0 twice and also 3 0 a couple of times. With the talent at their disposal, it's no surprise the opposition was swept aside. From the Torre brothers, Kolo and Yaya, to Salomon Kalou and Emmanuel Eboy and Didier Zakora, the Ivory Coast have players who've graced some of the very best leagues in the world. We are a team, but we do have individuals who play at a very high level. I'm thinking of Didier Drogba and Kolo Toure and his brother Yaya. All those players who play at a really high level. And I think they raise the quality of the national team, which is great. It's a nation that's capable of hurting any side in the world. But there is one player that stands out, even in Hali Holzic's talented squad. He's the man who shoulders the hopes of a nation, Chelsea's Didier Drogba. Perhaps he's the best player in the world right now, and for the Ivory Coast, he's just untouchable, indispensable. Untouchable, indispensable. The road to South Africa was not trauma-free. On the 29th of March, the Ivory Coast took on Malawi and Abidjan. A crush of people inside the stadium left more than 20 dead and many more injured. It was terribly disturbing because these people came to the stadium to enjoy themselves and it turned into this disaster. It's difficult, because we can't do anything ourselves to console the families. We just have to say how sorry we are and try to play well, because we can't do anything to replace these people. After two qualifying groups and 12 unbeaten matches, Vahid Halihodzic and his Ivory Coast squad could turn their thoughts to South Africa with an eye on improving upon their last underwhelming campaign in Germany. The Ivory Coast are paired with Brazil, Portugal and North Korea. It looks the toughest group of all. South Africa, well, we have to think in terms of getting through the group phase because we didn't manage to do that the last time around in Germany, which didn't go very well. I hope we do manage to get through the group, but a lot will depend on the draw, on luck, on many things. So we'll try and get through the group, and after that, you never know. After their opener against Portugal, Ivory Coast play Brazil at Soccer City and then North Korea in Nelspruit. I'd be so proud and so happy if the Ivory Coast or Ghana or any African country won the World Cup. I really want an African team to win it. If that team turns out to be us, then all the better. The People's Democratic Republic of Korea, or North Korea, is one of only five communist countries in the world and arguably the most secretive. Home to 24 million people, the country was run by Kim Il-sung from its independence in 1948 until his death in 1994. His successor is his son, Kim Jong-il, whose political policies are the source of international controversy. Footballers help North Korea make happier headlines. Everyone was hoping that we could qualify for the World Cup finals. As soon as we booked our place in the tournament, I believe we fulfilled the expectations of our people back home. These spectacular parades are typical of the communist nation, very different from its westernized neighbor to the south. Even though the Korean War between the two ended in 1953, they're both technically still in conflict. No peace treaty has ever been signed.
While South Africa marks South Korea's seventh successive World Cup finals, the North will be making only its second appearance at the tournament. Its first was in 1966, when they caused a major surprise by reaching the quarterfinals. After a long wait, here's a chance for North Koreans to cheer another sporting success. The fact that we are playing in the World Cup finals will give them hope, and it will also help in developing football in our country. After easily disposing of Mongolia 9-2 on aggregates in the initial Asian group playoffs, North Korea finished runners-up to neighbour South Korea in a four-team group that also included Turkmenistan and Jordan. That saw them progress to the final stage of two five-team groups where the top two would qualify for South Africa. South Korea, Iran and Saudi Arabia were highly fancied, but North Korea had other ideas. This 2-1 win in the United Arab Emirates in their opening game underlined their intentions. North Korea's first goal was an own goal from defender Bashir Saeed. And with the host pouring forward in search of an equaliser, substitute Anchol Chok scored with a superb individual effort. Although the UAE pulled one back with five minutes left, it didn't prevent North Korea from securing a precious away win and some vital self-belief. During qualifying, and this goes both for myself and my players, our performances meant that we gained so much confidence as a team. Their next game against their neighbours from the south should have been played before a full house in the North Korean capital, Pyongyang but only 3,000 watched when the game was moved to neutral Shanghai in China after the North refused to fly the South Korean flag or play its national anthem. Politics may have deprived them of home advantage, but North Korea were not intimidated. And they were awarded a penalty early in the second half when South Korea's captain, Kim Nang-il, upended Hong Yong-jo. Hong himself gave his country the lead and hopes of only a second ever victory over their southern neighbours. But that was not to be. Myung-duk Ri in the North Korean goal somehow failed to stop Sung Yong Ki's mishit shot. It finished one all, but North Korea had underlined they were real contenders. I'm not one to judge, but there are teams ranked higher than us who shouldn't be. I have to say, the ranking at the moment, it doesn't paint a fair picture. We should definitely be ranked higher than we are now. A sellout 65,000 gathered in Riyadh's King Fahd Stadium with North Korea and Saudi Arabia level on points. South Korea had already secured top spot and it was between the two for second place, with a draw favouring North Korea because of their superior goal difference. It was a matter of who was going to qualify for the World Cup finals automatically. At the time, we didn't have any fear in our hearts. We were courageous and played with pride. Finishing third would have meant a two-legged playoff against the third-place team in Group 2. The winners of that would face New Zealand over two legs for a place at the finals. Myung-guk Ri in the North Korean goal was determined his country would take the easy route, making save after save. Whatever the Saudis threw at him, Ri was equal to it. North Korea were back in the big time at last. So it was their superior goal difference that took North Korea to South Africa. They finished four points behind the group winners, South Korea. The draw was not kind to them, but having to face record champions Brazil and much fancied Cote d'Ivoire and Portugal in Group G is a challenge they're relishing. <laughs> We're going to go there and just ensure we play our game. It really doesn't matter who we're up against. With our strength and with our teamwork, we'll do our best when the tournament begins.
Group H in South Africa sees Spain joined by Switzerland, Chile and Honduras. At last, Spain had ended their 44 years of hurt. They had been football's biggest underachievers. Then they won the European Championships for the second time in 2008. The celebrations said it all. Luis Alvarez! It was tremendous. If you're not involved, you just can't imagine how it feels. Talking about it just isn't the same. From the airport to the centre of Madrid, there were a million people. It was incredible. It felt like you were touching the sky. It was fantastic. We can't begin to think what it would be like if Spain won the World Cup. It was Fernando Torres himself who got the winning goal in Vienna. After several generations of failure, Spain had won a major trophy at last. It was a truly historic moment for our game. I think the way in which we won it was spectacular, playing some really attractive football. It was our first European Championship for many years. The whole country went crazy. Spain continued their impressive form during qualifying for South Africa. A 100% record in qualifying, but they made it to the World Cup finals with two games remaining. They finished 11 points clear of second place Bosnia, Herzegovina. Ten games, ten wins. We inflicted a lot of big defeats and we didn't concede many goals. We played so well. It was great, and it would be hard to repeat a qualifying campaign like that. But we shouldn't rest on our laurels now. We have to keep working hard so that in the World Cup and the friendlies we'll play beforehand, we carry on as we're doing. You never expect to win all your games. That's very difficult. When you've just won the European Championship, other teams put men behind the ball and try and play for a draw. Today, a draw against Spain is considered a good result, so it's always more difficult for us. Now Spain are looking to win the World Cup for the first time. The closest they've come is fourth in 1950. Expectations, as always, are high. It used to be a case of whether Spain could handle the pressure to fulfill their potential. Now the question is, how will they cope with being one of the tournament favourites? The mentality now is different. We've won something, so others respect us. Before, they used to think Spain are a good side, but they never get past the quarterfinals, they never win the thing. Now Spain are a great team, and they're champions of Europe. That's what they're thinking now. We can sense that, especially when we face the big teams like France, Argentina and Italy, there's a lot more respect there, much more than before. They know we're capable of winning something, and that we're favourites, and on merit. Spain are among the favourites. That doesn't mean we are the favourites or Spain are going to win the World Cup because we won the European Championship. We're going there to do well, to get as far as we can, and with our feet on the ground. Four years ago in Germany, Spain were eliminated by eventual runners-up France in the last 16. Another setback that led some to question the mental strength of players who earn their money playing for some of the leading European club sides. But then came that trophy-winning breakthrough. And the Spanish squad in South Africa will be similar to that at Euro 2008, which certainly bodes well. The way they demolished Belgium 5-0 at home during the qualifiers underlined just what they're capable of. The opponents get a bit desperate because Spain keep the ball so well that they can't play. They can't even try and attack because they're simply overwhelmed. So they get tired, probably more psychologically than physically. That ability to keep the ball led to Spain's second goal, scored by David Villa. He and Torres usually grab the headlines for their goal-scoring exploits. But Torres is just delighted they've discovered a winning formula to go with their fluent football.
difícil ver una selección que juegue. It's hard to find a national team or a club side that play good football and win. Normalmente los equipos que juegan muy Usually bien the teams no that play the nice stuff Todo don't win trophies. But everyone likes to watch the Spanish Todo national team play. They like to see the national team players in action. So when we play, people at home and abroad sit down in front of the television and enjoy it. And this newfound confidence means it's not just the strikers who can score for Del Bosque's team. Villa set up Barcelona centre-half Gerard Piquet to score his third goal at international level. The victory over Belgium was one of a world record run of 15 consecutive wins that lasted until a defeat by the United States at the Confederations Cup last June. David Villa won the golden boot as Euro 2008's leading scorer, and he also finished as Spain's top marksman in the qualifiers with seven goals. A former Spanish international player, 59-year-old Vicente del Bosque, took over as coach when Luis Aragonés stepped down after leading his country to success at Euro 2008. It was a tough act to follow, but del Bosque has won the players over. He's a coach who is very close to his players, and he's very good in that respect. Tactically, I think we can all see what he's like. But the way he and his assistants treat you is so good. And it's ensured that the feel-good factor we had before is still going strong. The European champions face Switzerland in Durban before taking on Honduras at Ellis Park and Chile in Pretoria. It should be an easy group for Spain. But we always seem to have more problems against the teams that are considered to be weaker. We prefer to play against the better teams or the teams with bigger names because the motivation is greater. In the summer of 2008, Switzerland hosted the European Championships with their neighbours Austria. For a few brief weeks, the Swiss nation was at the heart of the football universe. Their people were gripped by football fever. From an organisational point of view, it was a huge success. Also, the way it all went in Switzerland and the excitement it generated. What wasn't quite as successful was that we were knocked out early. And of course, this was quite negative as far as we were concerned. So Switzerland retreated to its understated ways. The football team had suffered stage fright, but life continued in this beautiful nation of mountains, lakes, cattle and hillside villas. But after seven years in charge of the national team, Kobe Kuhn gave way to the highly respected German coach, Ottmar Hitzfeld. A new era was about to begin. Kobe Kuhn did great things. We took part in major tournaments. We haven't quite made it to a quarter-final or a semi-final yet, but that's a motivation for all of us. And the importance of football has really grown here. Of course, we have skiing and ice hockey, but I still think that football is the number one Swiss national sport. It was Hitzfeld's introduction to international football but he is one of the most successful coaches in the world game and twice a Champions League winner with German clubs. Everyone was expecting great results with Otmar Hitzfeld. It started, though, with a rather frustrating draw against Israel because Switzerland were winning 2-1 with just a few seconds to go. And then we had that disastrous result when Switzerland lost against Luxembourg in the most humiliating defeat of our history. That was in Zurich during a home game. So from that moment on, everyone asked, what's going on with the team? What's going on with Hitzfeld? Losing at home to Luxembourg was, to say the least, catastrophic. But perhaps that was the moment when the German really made his mark. It was a point of no return. It was a little discouraging, but at the same time, that defeat was the key to winning everything after that. We went on to beat Greece and Latvia, and that was when the change happened. 
das ist da so It was so that we could start a new era or we could start a new run. Then the home game versus Greece was all about who would be first in the group. Or should I say, who could be first in the group. And by winning at home, we put ourselves in a very good position. So after crashing out of the Euros in 2008, the Swiss had turned their fortunes around. Thanks largely to Blaise and Kufu and the captain Alexander Frey, who shared 10 goals. The Swiss start their World Cup in Durban against Spain. Then they play Chile and Honduras. Well, of course, I hope that my self-confidence rubs off on the team. And we're convinced that we can reach the first knockout stage when we're in South Africa and can then even go one round further. You have to believe in yourself. You have to give the maximum in effort and performance. If we can do this, and we work together well as a team, then we can really beat anybody. Durban is the third largest city in South Africa, and its 70,000-seat stadium will host the likes of Germany, Spain and Brazil during the group stages. Home to more than 3.5 million people, this is KwaZulu-Natal's biggest city and the busiest port in South Africa. Great beaches and an average winter temperature of 22 degrees attract tourists all year round to the Golden Mile, which is actually four kilometers of beaches, promenades and restaurants. It's here the city's fan park will be situated during the World Cup. Durban is renowned for its subtropical climate. The city is the gateway to the national parks and the historic sites of Zululand and Drakensberg. The 70,000-seater Moses Mabida Stadium is a newly built arena that has already won several building and design awards. Named after the former General Secretary of South Africa's Communist Party, the stadium's bold design took inspiration from the national flag. The two legs of the Grand Arch fused together, representing the unity of a once divided nation. The 350-metre-long arch can be climbed to reach a viewing point 100 metres above the pitch, although most people seem to prefer to take the sky car. The stadium is now the pride of the city. Well, as a South African and a person from Durban, I think it's very, very special and an honour to be hosting it here. It's nice to have the superstars in my city. It's quite amazing because uh, I don't have to travel the world to see all the superstars and pay so much money. I have the feasibility of having them here in my city so I can see all of them. That's really good. Everyone wants to see those big players that you see playing in the Champions League and English Premier League. And everyone wants to see the big superstars finally show down in the World Cup. I already have my German ship, so just waiting for them to rock up. The likes of Balak and uh, Klose is a very good goal scorer and, uh, and uh, Schweinsteiger as well. It's a good player. Yeah. been talking about the World Cup and planning for it for so long and now it's six months away or just less than six months away. I think the, the spirit in the city is just incredible since the final draw on the 4th of December people all they're talking about is the World Cup and have you got tickets and which matches are you going to and real excitement and pride that it's coming to our country and specifically our city. The last time the team they call La Roja played at the World Cup was back at France 98. 
So when qualification was confirmed, the people of Santiago took to the streets. It was an Argentinian, Marcelo Bielsa, who led Chile to qualification. He has already been to a World Cup himself, having led his country eight years ago. We were extremely fortunate to have a coach who wanted to change the way we thought. And although we had good players, we were always too afraid to attack in the away games. He changed our way of thinking, our mentality. I like the way he works, his maturity, his communication skills. He puts a lot of effort into training and explains everything really well. And in the end, that allowed us to reach our goal, which was to go to the World Cup. The team was constantly changing. You'd always see us training together, but the interesting thing was that no one was ever guaranteed a place. That meant we always had to be in shape and ready. Chile stumbled through the early part of their qualifying campaign and then entertained Argentina in Santiago, seeking revenge after defeat in Buenos Aires. On to Gary Medell. Medell's pulled back here. Ariana! It's his first ever goal for Chile. Fabian Ariana with the finish. And Chile have got the goal. It came down to the last two matches, the first in Medellin. A win against Colombia would see Chile through to South Africa 2010. It turned out to be quite a match. Martinez is away from the defender and the goalkeeper. Can he roll it home? It's been put in by the defender. Oh, superb play by Jackson Martinez. Three caps, three goals. Great ball in, and the header comes in from Ponche. And it's the equaliser for Chile. Here's Jackson Martinez, the striker who was marking him, and they're in again here. And Suazo scores! Oh, two goals in a minute from Chile. Oh, pandemonium in the penalty area. And Rodriguez with his first touch heads goalwards. And blasted goalwards by Yepes. And in! It's the equaliser for Colombia! Oh, it's a beautifully worked move. Scored by Jorge Valdivia. Heartbreak for Colombia. Suazo was offside, the keeper comes, it's in! A fourth goal for Chile which surely seals their place in the World Cup Finals. It's joy for Chile, who had to fight very hard for these three points, but it's enough to put them into the World Cup Finals in South Africa. After a slow start, it turned into a fantastic campaign for Chile, who qualified ahead of both Paraguay and Argentina. After a marathon of 18 qualification matches, Marcelo Bielsa's team finished in second place. The way we qualified was amazing. It was very tough, but we won a lot of away games, and I think that was the fundamental reason for our qualification. Chile are in Nelspreit on June the 16th to play Honduras before facing Switzerland and finally Spain. The most crucial match of Honduras's qualification campaign was played between the United States and Costa Rica. While Honduras were winning away in El Salvador in the final match of their qualifying campaign, Costa Rica were leading 2-0 away in the United States. A scoreline that would clinch them an automatic place ahead of Honduras. But with 20 minutes left, the USA, who'd already qualified themselves, pulled a goal back through Michael Bradley. And then, deep into injury time, Jonathan Bornstein headed home to make it 2-2. Triggering wild celebrations in Washington, 
and 2,000 miles south in the Honduran capital, Tegucigalpa. Costa Rica had been pipped to the final automatic qualifying spot by Honduras, who could look forward to a World Cup for the first time in 28 years. Qualification was very difficult. On our part, we lost a key game to the United States in San Pedro Sula. That meant qualification was no longer in our own hands. And then four days later, the game against El Salvador, a game we had to win at all costs, and then await the result between the USA and Costa Rica. And thank God the USA did what they did. It meant we qualified. In June 2009, Honduras was a country in crisis, as events off the pitch threatened to derail Honduran qualification to South Africa. A political coup instigated by the country's military against left-wing president Manuel Zelaya plunged the country into a state of emergency. As chaos reigned in the Central American Republic, the national team somehow managed to keep their focus. It was frightening. At times we were scared because of what was going on off the pitch, especially before certain matches. But nonetheless we kept our focus, we never lost sight of our objective. So in the end, we achieved what we wanted to. Despite everything, the national side flourished. A unifying force in a divided country, Los Catrachos went on to record impressive wins over Costa Rica and Trinidad and Tobago, just weeks after the coup. Previously, they'd beaten neighbours and arch-rivals El Salvador at home. And they caused one of the biggest upsets in qualifying by overcoming the regional heavyweights, Mexico. From the start of the qualification campaign, we knew we had a great chance of making it to the World Cup. I think the 3-0 win against Mexico showed we were capable of doing it. It demonstrated what we had to do if we were going to qualify for South Africa. Honduras finished third in the CONCACAF group, clinching the last automatic spot for South Africa 2010. Costa Rica were pushed into a two-legged playoff against Uruguay, which they lost so Los Ticos missed out on the World Cup finals for the first time in 12 years. Led by Colombian coach Reynaldo Rueda, Honduras boast eight players at clubs in Europe. Amongst them Tottenham's Wilson Palacios and Genoa's David Suazo. But their key man in qualifying was veteran striker Carlos Pavon. Currently playing back home in the Honduran league, the 36-year-old scored seven goals in nine appearances during the qualification campaign. It was Pavon who spearheaded Honduras's drive to South Africa. Carlos Pavon is a very important player for us. He's the one who scored most of our goals. He has the respect of the entire squad. He's 36 years old now, so we're in debt to him for the sacrifices he makes to play for the national team. He carries himself with great dignity and he's someone we all admire. It won't be easy for Honduras in Group H. They face Chile first, followed by Spain and Switzerland. For Honduras, no one gives us a chance. Everyone is writing us off and no one gives us a chance. They all think we're going to be the whipping boys of this tournament, but things like this only serve to motivate us further. In the past, the toughest opponents for the big teams have often been the smaller, less well-known sides. We're going to the World Cup as a small nation with big ambitions. I know it might sound crazy, but I think Honduras can win the World Cup. It doesn't hurt to dream. It's not going to be easy because there's a lot of great teams in front of us. But with the support of everyone back home, then we've got every chance of becoming world champions. The sights and sounds of South Africa are already spectacular. But in June 2010, they will become even more so. 
32 teams will set out in pursuit of the dream to become world champions. Make sure you don't miss football's greatest show on earth, World Cup 2010.